There are a number of common geometries that appear in physics problems. Uh, we'll start by considering the geometry of complementary angles. The crossing of two perpendicular lines forms a right angle, or a 90 degree angle. We typically show this by overlaying a small square inside the angle that is 90 degrees. Two angles that add up to 90 degrees are called complementary angles. Another way to say this is that two angles that together will fill a right angle are complementary and therefore sum to 90 degrees. That means if you see a geometry in which you know one of the angles that fill this 90 degree um, crossing, then you can calculate the other angle of interest by taking 90 degrees and subtracting the angle that you know. For example, if we know that angle alpha here is 25 degrees, then you can calculate this angle beta by simply subtracting 25 from 90 to get 65 degrees. The next geometry that we'll look at is the geometry of having supplementary angles. Two angles that sum to 180 degrees are called supplementary angles. One way we see this is that the two neighboring angles that are formed when two straight lines intersect are supplementary and add to 180 degrees. In this case, the angle labeled alpha and the angle labeled beta formed with the crossing of these two straight lines sum to 180 degrees. This of course means that if you know the angle alpha but don't know the angle beta and you see this geometry, then you can calculate the angle beta by simply taking 180 minus the angle alpha. Again, as an example, if alpha is 25 degrees here, then the angle beta would be calculated as 180 minus 25 degrees, which gives you 155 degrees for angle beta. The third common geometry you will see is, again, having two intersecting lines, and you are interested in the opposing angles formed by these two straight lines. In this geometry, the two opposing angles are always equal to each other. So if you know one angle over here, you automatically know the other angle to be equal to that one. There are actually two sets of opposing angles formed whenever you intersect two straight lines. And so this angle here is automatically equal to that angle. Finally, the last geometry we'll consider is when two parallel lines are both intersected by a third straight line. In this case, there will be sets of corresponding angles that are formed that are equal to each other. Specifically, this angle and this angle, these interior angles, are going to be equal to each other. So this angle will equal to this angle. And you can partly see why this is from the geometries we've already looked at, because we know that this angle is equal to its opposite angle, so this would also be alpha, and that this angle by symmetry, since these two lines are parallel and this is the same line, must equal to this one. Of course, there's other sets of corresponding angles shown here in magenta. This angle corresponds to this angle, and so they are both equal to each other. There are two ways that angles are often reported. One way is to measure angles in degrees, and another is to measure angles in radians. Although we're more familiar with measuring angles in degrees, the radian is really the more natural unit for measuring angles when you're dealing with angles in a circle. Let's consider a circle with a radius of r, as shown in the figure here. Right? If we take that length r and trace it along the arc of the circle's perimeter, then the angle that swept out by that length r along the perimeter will end up giving you the angle of exactly one radian, where one radian is roughly 57.3 degrees. A full circle, which by definition is 360 degrees, therefore works out to be exactly two pi radians. Let's think of that unit circle as a clock face where the clock arm rotates counterclockwise around that circle. If the arm length is defined as having a radius of 1, then the tip will trace out a unit circle. 
If we illuminate the clock from the side, the vertical shadow of the clock arm changes its length sinusoidally as the arm rotates. Similarly, if we illuminate from above, the arm's horizontal shadow changes its length sinusoidally as the arm rotates as well. Let's define zero degrees on the unit circle as pointing straight to the right, as we previously mentioned, and positive angles as running counterclockwise starting from zero degrees. Let's trace out these shadows on a running strip of paper as the angle goes from zero degrees around the unit circle to 360 degrees. Notice that the vertical shadow tip starts at zero for zero degrees. Right? The shadow is right here. On the other hand, the horizontal shadow starts at plus one for zero degrees. As we trace these out, you see that the vertical and horizontal shadows trace out a sinusoidal curve. The vertical shadow tip is described by the function y is equal to sine of the angle theta, while the horizontal shadow tip is described by the function x is equal to cosine of the angle theta. Let's consider a situation where we rotate to an arbitrary angle on the unit circle. And let's take a closer look at the horizontal and vertical projections. Let's extrapolate this to a vector of Let's extrapolate this to a vector of arbitrary length as well as an arbitrary angle. The horizontal projection of this vector is given by r cosine theta. The x component of this vector is given by the horizontal projection or shadow of this vector is given by x is equal to r cosine theta. While the vertical projection or vertical shadow of the vector is given by y is equal to r sine of theta. These projections are also called the horizontal and vertical components of this arbitrary vector. From this, you can see that the trigonometric functions, sine, cosine, tangent, can be written in terms of the sides of a right triangle formed with the angle theta. We can refer to the side of the triangle that is opposite the angle, or the side of the triangle that is adjacent to the angle, and of course, the slanted side of the right triangle is called the hypotenuse. In this way, the sine of the angle is given by the ratio of the opposite over the hypotenuse, while the cosine of the angle is given by the ratio of the adjacent to the hypotenuse. And then the tangent of the angle is given by the ratio of the opposite over the adjacent.